Hello, my name is Rupa Sanghani and I'm the Director of Nuclear Cardiology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. This is the first video in a series sponsored by the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology on practical considerations in starting a cardiac PET program. Now a monograph on this topic has been published by ASNIC and GE and is available on ASNIC's website. These videos that were created to provide a much more approachable discussion on the important points in the monograph. And as the first video in the series today, I'm going to be reviewing for you what to consider in your pre-planning stage when you're first getting started in discussing how are you going to start your cardiac PET program. Cardiac PET has clearly become the pinnacle of nuclear cardiac imaging. There's a wealth of data on its use for both diagnosis and prognosis, and the advantages are clear. High diagnostic accuracy, consistent high quality images, low radiation exposure, a short protocol, strong prognostic power, and the ability to quantitate blood flow and flow reserve. It really allows for imaging the full breadth of ischemia for our patients from the epicardial level where we can now distinguish focal versus diffuse disease, all the way down to the microvasculature and the ability to diagnose coronary microvascular disease. Of course, other uses for cardiac PET include viability, cardiac sarcoidosis, and emerging indications for device and valve infection. And despite all of these advantages, I know that there is concern for people starting the program because they're worried about cost, reimbursement, considerations regarding the CT, or even just where to get started in this planning process. Much of why this monograph was created was to help you in that process and to delineate or outline an approach to how to get started. Now the monograph provides a checklist of considerations. We broke it down into five main categories. I'll be reviewing today with you for the pre-planning stage, but we also have talks coming on equipment what do you need to think about when you're looking at camera technology, software, and tracers? The program setup or design? What are considerations regarding staffing, scheduling, the room design? Of course, very important, the business of nuclear cardiology. How are you gonna pitch a cardiac pet program to your administrators? And how are you gonna discuss the costs and the reimbursement considerations that are important? And of course, as you get started, what education is needed for your players in your lab, your technologists, your nurses, and your MDs? And then how are you even gonna um, educate your referring physicians on both the importance of the study and what flow and flow reserve means? Now we're focusing today on the pre-planning stage. We'll talk about how to assess your current state, what are your goals and vision for the program, what are the constraints that you might need to consider, budgetary, space, et cetera, at your institution? How are you going to delineate a team and champions, both on the physician and the technologist level? The importance of reviewing the PET guidelines, and then of course, specific considerations you want to think about if you're getting a PET CT camera for your attenuation correction. Now, it's important to understand that there is no one size fits all here. Every lab will have its own individual goals, constraints, vision, budget, and you need to pick what is gonna be right for your program and for your lab. And I would tell people that although we would want the best and the most exciting technology, get your foot in the door in any way you can and provide good quality imaging. Once you've shown your worth, you will be able to upgrade your cameras and build on the, the basis that you've started. The first step in the pre-planning process, it's recommended that you look at your current state and assess your data. You want to know what your volume of pharmacologic spec studies are. PET is currently only indicated for farm stress testing. Of those, how many do you expect would convert from farm spec to farm PET versus what incremental new volume in pharmacologic stress testing might you bring in? You'd want to look at who your referring physicians are 
how many of them have complex coronary disease that they're assessing and that you would want flow and flow reserve or the addition of calcium scoring. What are your current capabilities for CT at your institution? And is there availability at your institution for other modalities for viability or more advanced imaging? Next, you want to define your goals for the program and your vision. Aim big. Go for the best you can. If you had an ideal cardiac PET program, what would it look like? Would you just be doing myocardial perfusion imaging or including blood flow? Would you be doing calcium scoring on, on patients as much as possible? Thinking ahead as well about the tracers you'd be using. In the US currently, N13 ammonia and rubidium 82 are FDA approved for PET myocardial perfusion imaging. In the future though, new radio tracers may be available. You wanna think about how you can grow your lab as time goes on. If you will be expanding to more advanced imaging, such as sarcoid viability or inflammation and infection, or as new radio tracers come on the horizon, you wanna make sure that your program is set up for growth and including your rooms and your room design. Shielding is a critical component to room setup and you wanna make sure that your rooms are shielded up front to account for CT and for higher isotope agents like F18. In addition to knowing your vision, you also want to look at what are your constraints at your particular uh, practice. Now this can include your budget, space, or vendor limitations if you have specific contracts with certain vendors. In regards to PET CT in particular, you want to think about your space and room design, the cost and build out, and the shielding required. You also have to think about how you're going to train technologists for CT and how you're going to address non-cardiac findings. It's important to know your state-specific requirements. For example, some states do not allow nuclear medicine technologists to perform diagnostic quality CTs. Now, CAC scoring and the gating required for CAC falls under that category. Next, it's important to designate your team leads. Now, this should include a physician lead, a head nuclear medicine technologist, and a nursing lead. These people are going to be instrumental in building excitement about your program, educating, outreach, and continuing quality improvement once you get started. From the beginning, we took an interdisciplinary approach to our setup, regularly meeting with nursing, our scheduling group, pre-authorization and billing group, coding, radiation safety, and a physicist to ensure that everyone at the table was thinking about their part of the process as we designed our cardiac PET program, and having everyone's input was invaluable. In particular, I think that access to a PET physicist is really helpful and can facilitate decision-making on technology, tracers, and protocols. Now, before you get started, it's critically important that you educate yourself first as the physician lead on the specifics of cardiac PET. You wanna understand some of these subtle nuances before you make any financial decisions regarding technology and tracers so that you really know that you're getting what you want for your lab. Fortunately, ASNIC has a lot of guidelines published now that are very useful to educate yourself. There are the original SNNMI ASNIC guidelines that go through the technology. There are now imaging guidelines, flow quantification guidelines and how to approach flow, and of course the ASNIC PET workshops, which are a great way to get hands-on training with cases We've now had many labs come, the entire lab comes, um, you know, multiple physicians so that they can learn as a group and make sure they know how to interpret and report their studies properly. The last important consideration in your pre-planning stage is to consider if you will be performing coronary artery calcium scoring or cardiac inflammation or infection imaging, as that will require a PET scanner paired with a CT for its CT attenuation. Now, with CT imaging, it's very important to consider how are you going to incorporate the non-cardiac findings into your imaging reports. 
Will those be performed and read by radiology or will those be interpreted by cardiology? And what are the legal ramifications of each in your practice? From a calcium scoring standpoint, which patient population will you be performing this on if you're doing it routinely? And last, I would say that myocardial blood flow reserve is clearly one of the most significant advantages of PET-MPI and adds significant improvement in diagnostic quality. It is strongly recommended that this be a consideration for every new PET lab. I'd like to summarize what we've discussed today with this final slide. I like to summarize by thinking about the who, what, where, why, and how. Who are your referral sources? Will you be simply transitioning farm spec patients to PET or bringing in incremental volume of new studies? And how are you gonna target your referrals? What will you be performing? Simply myocardial perfusion imaging or will you be adding the incredible benefit of flow and flow reserve? And will you be doing advanced cardiac PET with viability, sarcoid, or infection imaging? Where are you gonna set up your cardiac PET program? Will you be using existing space or will you be looking at a new place? And you have to take into consideration the design and the shielding of those rooms. And more importantly, how is that gonna change in the future with future needs. If there's new technology or the ability to upgrade to a CT, you're better off shielding that room now. And you wanna think about new tracers that may require additional shielding. Why? What is your primary goal in moving to cardiac PET? And then finally, how are you gonna do this? Will you use existing or new cameras? And will your camera be dedicated to cardiac studies or shared with radiology for non-cardiac studies? Thank you for your attention. I hope that today's talk has given you a really good overview on what to think about in the pre-planning stage of building a cardiac pet program.